T minus 17. Final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7. Ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. 2, 1, 0. We have a liftoff. This is a room where I spent a great deal of time, particularly during each of the Apollo missions. There were 400,000 Americans, plus many more, that were involved in the Apollo program. These were my friends here in this room. I spent a lot of time with them. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The launch of Sputnik was a very important catalyst. Sputnik was the first artificial satellite of the Earth. It really galvanized a generation of young Americans and who decided that this was something they were very interested in. I think everybody pretty much realized that this was, psychologically, was going to be a very important part of the nation's effort to survive the Cold War. I had spent so much time here in the Moker with the flag uh, that uh, the backup flag for Apollo 11 uh, being displayed here. I went to Gene Kranz and said, uh, Gene, why don't we take that flag and fly it on the moon? And uh, we'll take another flag to replace it. And so the flag that you have in the Moker from then on will have been to the moon. And he said, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And so the flag we actually deployed on the moon was the flag that had flown in the Moker uh, throughout Apollo, except for Apollo 17. Well, when the panel in front of you is vibrating, you can't read the dials. And so you just become a passenger for about two minutes and 45 seconds. On the second stage, everything's much calmer and much, and much easier to, uh, to participate in the launch. But again, uh, the crew was, were passengers, except for the fact that they had to stay very much in tune with what was going on so that if something happened, you could actually fly the rocket into orbit. Once the translunar insertion burn of the S-4B was completed, then the next thing that had to be done was to uh, extract the lunar module from the uh, front end of that uh, S-4B. Uh, so it could go to the moon with you. We were not attached to the lunar module during launch. Uh, so uh, the, uh, there was a, a procedure called transposition and docking where we would undock with the rocket, move away a little bit, turn around, and then come in and dock with the lunar module uh, so that we had it attached to the front of our, our uh, command and service module. During the, the three days to the moon, uh, we had a, quite a few technical things to do, operational things to do. And I had planned before I left uh, the Earth to try to do meteorological observations based on my history of my father, who was very interested in meteorology. And one of the pictures I took to document all of this was what became what's known as the blue marble photograph, which is a nearly full Earth picture uh, in which Africa dominates the, uh, the scene, as well as Antarctica. Uh, that, uh, that picture uh, was part of a, a whole long series of pictures, but it turns out it has had a lot of influence and a lot of interest in time since. I'll tell you, if there ever was a fragile appearing piece of blue in space, it's the Earth right now. One of the interesting aspects of uh, spaceflight is that uh, you, you have to uh, eliminate uh, urine, and, and that urine was dumped overboard. And anytime you, you put something overboard, it adds a propulsive input to the spacecraft. And for three days, you know, the people are sitting here watching what we were doing. They didn't have an awful lot to do, so they figured out how to do these, what they called urine burns that uh, just improved our trajectory a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
We had planned uh, before the mission uh, that uh, we would alternate being on the comm loop during the rest periods. And Ron had the first duty, uh, and he was over in this uh, left-hand seat here. When uh, it became time to wake up, the ground sent their usual musical wake-up call, and Ron didn't wake up. And of course, we were not on the comm. And the first I knew about it was I uh, uh, woke up for some other reason and looked up and I could see the caution and warning panel. And it has a big red light on it if the ground is trying to get in touch with you or if you have a big problem. And the natural learned response when you see that light on is to reach up, punch it off. All you had to do is hit it to punch it off. And when I touched it, it was very hot. So it obviously had been on a long time. And it just turns out that the ground did everything they could to wake Ron up and they just they never did. And we, so I finally woke Ron up. And it turns out that was a problem he had even when he was a fighter pilot, is uh, waking up on the carrier. But uh, from then on, we just took him off of comm duty. The Valley of Tars Litro, it was a complex place to land. It was a deep mountain valley, deeper than the Grand Canyon. Mountains on either side to uh, 7,000 feet on one side and, and about 5,000 feet on the other. Only, uh, only about five miles wide. I immediately started to dig a, a, a half trench across the, uh, uh, that deposit and it turned out to be uh, uh, the orange soil. That became, at the time, that's all we called it. And when we finally got it back to earth, it, everybody realized that it was volcanic ash, very colorful volcanic ash. And it's become an extremely important uh, suite of samples from that trench that has told us, it tells us now about the history of the moon, about the internal structure of the moon. It's, it's amazing the kind of information that's coming out of that. Re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere was uh, a really very straightforward, but did have a violent character to it. First of all, you very quickly uh, began to decelerate up to about 7 Gs deceleration. That was so that the spacecraft was captured in the atmosphere and that you didn't skip out. You could literally skip out. And once you uh, came off that 7 Gs, you held about 4.5 Gs. Uh, as the computer and the guidance system uh, sought a precise point on the Earth's surface where the carrier was located. Now actually, our computer, our guidance system was much better than the Navy's and so the Navy tended to park the carrier about five nautical miles away from that point. Well, I, I said, I started out saying, I'm walking on the moon one day in the merry, merry month of, and I said December, and someone corrected me, I believe, and said May. May, when they're much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. My personal message was that uh, this was the beginning of our of human species transition into the universe. And I wanted uh, to have young people realize that they, that what their future might entail and the future of their children might entail of actually human beings moving out in the universe to uh, uh, protect the uh, survival of the species. We know what happened to the dinosaurs and uh, that could happen to us. And the, and the more we can move into the universe, the more the human species can survive.